I'm going to talk to you today about uh, hysterectomy. Um, you often uh, are asked about hysterectomy, but unfortunately, these days, because of difficulties with admitting patients and also because technology has, has taken the place of uh, hysterectomy, we don't see that many anymore in our operating rooms. So why are hysterectomies performed? Many different reasons are uh, noted fibroids, heavy periods, prolapse, endometriosis, adenomyosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and a variety of gynecological cancers are all indications for hysterectomy. There are several alternatives to hysterectomy nowadays. And because of this, the overall number of hysterectomies performed has reduced. We do have effective medical management of bleeding problems or endometriosis. We can perform endometrial resection or ablation for menorrhagia. Myomectomy, uterine artery embolization, highly focused uh, ultrasound, etc., can be used for managing fibroids. And radiotherapy is now used for managing early stage disease of uh, cancers of the cervix. There are a number of clinical trials and systematic reviews which have looked at these alternatives. And combining patients' and clinicians' opinions uh, will often come to a conclusion with respect to the best option for the various conditions uh, described. There are a few different types of hysterectomy. Uh, subtotal hysterectomy is performed when it's just the uterine body is uh, removed. Total hysterectomy includes the uterine body and the cervix, although not the ovaries. Uh, hysterectomy of BSO, that's where the uterus and both old tubes and ovaries are removed. Or radical and vertime hysterectomies, uh, these are usually performed for cervical cancers with the uh, removal of pelvic lymph nodes, uh, parasitic tissue, and the upper third of the vagina. This particular diagram uh, just demonstrates that, that the total hysterectomy where the cervix and the body of the uterus is performed. A radical hysterectomy is where the parametrium out further is performed with identification of the ureters on either side. Uh, BSO, bilateral salpingoprectomy, when both tubes and ovaries are removed. And a super cervical or a subtotal hysterectomy when the cervix is left in place. Now I'm going to show you um, a laparoscopic hysterectomy that I performed um, just to demonstrate, I suppose, the advantages of laparoscopic surgery, but also it takes, through, it takes you through some of the steps uh, involved in a laparoscopic um, hysterectomy. So I'm just going to enlarge this here. I will flick through the, um, the procedure. Um, these are instruments that are used. This is called, called a harmonic scalpel. Um, and it's, uh, it uses kinetic energy, or where that blade is moving at 55,000 times a second. But what's happening here is we're dividing the anterior leaf of the peritoneum with the broad ligament around to where the bladder is. That's the bladder area there. These are the adnexal structures, it's the round ligaments. So once you divide the round ligament, you get the anterior leaf of the broad ligament, and that's what uh, we're taking down here. And it comes across to where the bladder is, and you get the uterine cycle fold here. So by simply lifting, the uterus cycle fold, um, the bladder is down there somewhere. But what we want to do is we want to get the bladder off the cervix because the bladder is one of the structures that can be quite easily injured um, at the time of hysterectomy. And that's what uh, I'm doing here is just removing the, uh, the tissue, uh, that the loose areolar tissue that holds the bladder in place. And that's gently done. Uh, once we've done that, and we can divide more of the structures out on the adnexa. And this is just dividing the posterior leaf of the broad ligament. Uh, an ovary is left out here. And we get in close to the side of the uterus where the uterine artery uh, and veins are. And that's what the, the uh, device is dividing here. I'm also using some bipolar energy, uh, which is just regular electrical energy for uh, taking down the uterine arteries. And as we come in close to the side of the uterus, that's what we get. Now, whether you're doing a total abdominal hysterectomy or whether you're doing a vaginal hysterectomy, the principles are pretty well the same. We divide the structures, uh, we separate the structures uh, on the front and back of the uterus um, from the uterus, and then in a stepwise fashion, either from below or from above, we remove the, um, or we divide the structures holding the uterus in place. And that is the tubo ovarian pedicle, the uterine vessels, and also then down to the uh, uterosacral and cardinal ligament complex. So again, we're just dividing here, found the level of where the upper vagina meets the cervix, 
And by using the harmonic scalpel, we can divide into the tissue, separating the uterus off. And you can see here that both uterine arteries are divided, so the uterus has no blood flowing to it right now. Um, this particular device is very useful because the temperature only goes up to about 120 degrees, so there's not a lot of heat uh, generated. This is the cervix now, so that we're looking into the upper vagina. No sutures, as you will see, are used um, a lot of the time with laparoscopic hysterectomy. Um, and this is just dividing the vaginal cuff around the cervix. So that's what's showing here. And now when the uterus becomes separated, which we'll demonstrate just here in one second, uh, you'll see the open upper end of the, the vagina with the device inside for keeping the gas in the, the vagina. Now the uterus can be removed down through the vagina. That's what's happening here. Um, and an assistant down below will grab the cervix and just bring it down into the vagina. A lot of times I just use the uterus to keep the vagina closed while we suture the upper vagina. Um, and that's just going to be demonstrated here. And we'll start suturing the, the vagina, the cuff of the vagina closed, including the uterus sacral ligament. I'm trying to avoid um, the uterine, uh, or the ureter. This is the showing the uh, ovary on that side. I'm just closing the vagina vault like that. Now I'm going to quickly just show you, and I'm using um, some YouTube videos just to demonstrate these. It should link out to the vaginal hysterectomy. And I'll just try and fly through this. A vaginal hysterectomy, uh, the cervix is identified, infiltration usually around the cervix. And again, this is just showing that. This is uh, local anesthetic of the cervix. It's been pulled down the vagina, the bladder. And the vagina is underneath the vaginal skin is there as the posterior fornix in behind. Um, and the surgeon will take the bladder off the front. So again, what we're doing is just opening the, the bladder. Uh, so this is the bladder now being removed off the front of the uterus, the cervix there in the tenaculums or the graspers. And then we'll cut and divide the uterus sacral ligaments. those off and they'll be used later to suspend the ball to the vagina. And again, they will enter into the pouch of Douglas posterior aspect, and that's what's happening here. And you see the opening there in the pouch of Douglas and the surgeon's finger will go into that space. So now we've separated the bladder off the front, we can separate the, uh, the space in behind also have divided the uterus sacral ligaments on either side, so that's just showing that into the part of the pelvis. Sometimes you'll see small bowel in that space. And then by dividing the arteries on either side, the uterine arteries, and you get up along the, they're all tied up, grasped tied, so we're now looking down the side of the uterus here, the cervix being grasped, and the vessels have just been tied off there, same happening on the other side, the clamps are put on the vessels, uh, they're cut and tied. Showing now the, the uh, left side of the uterus there. And it's just showing how we suture the pedicles on either side. And as we move up along the side of the ure uterus, we get up to the structure of the, the fallopian tubes and the round ligament up higher. They're cut and divided as well. So you can see in a stepwise fashion, we take the, the structures, the uterosacral ligaments, the um, uterine artery, and the tube ovarian pedicle complex at the high, at the upper end. And they're divided. Because, you know, this is showing it happening on the other side, and the uterus can remove it. Let's just try to quickly see so both. There are the tubes and uh, round ligaments in the clamp. They're tied off and they will be incorporated into the vault of the vagina. And a quick look at abdominal hysterectomy. Again, right, this. And this will demonstrate the suprapubic or fan and steel incision that's used. Layers down. This is just showing opening the abdominal wall. And you can see the morbidity alone with this um, 
does increase the pain, it does increase the potential for postoperative complications. And that's why hysterectomy, total abdominal hysterectomy, is really a, a procedure that um, has its place in only a few instances now, as opposed to the commonest procedure that used to be performed for uh, removing the uterus of the past. So now the uterus, the fundus of the uterus, the tube and round ligaments on either side, they are grasped and clamped. And then in a stepwise fashion, uh, they are divided, the round ligaments and the broad ligament is opened up, and the ureter is identified on either side, the uterus is grasped, the tube ovarian uh, complex is divided. So you can see we're doing this in a top-down fashion as opposed to the, the other approach at vaginal hysterectomy. And step by step, the bladder then is reflected off the front of the uterus after you divide the upper pedicles. So it's pushed down. The uterine arteries are clamped and divided. That's just demonstrating that. And then we have the cervix with the uterine arteries divided. And it's now a matter of opening into the vagina and clamping the uterosacral ligaments on either side. I like the laparoscopic approach. You can see that the front of the uterus or the vagina is open, the cervix is visible, um, and uh, these uh, pedicles will be uh, divided and the vault of the vagina will be, will be closed. And that's what's shown. And you can see there's a huge difference between this and the laparoscopic approach. And the abdominal hysterectomy is the most morbid uh, approach to uh, hysterectomy. So which route is best? Well, abdominal hysterectomy, we know, we know um, causes uh, greatest blood loss. It also is associated with the highest febrile morbidities. Um, and wound infections, um, obviously, is associated with uh, this type of hysterectomy. Also, the longest recovery time and the longest hospitalizations. Vaginal hysterectomy is the preferred route when technically possible. A laparoscopic hysterectomy, although uh, a very good procedure, does require a lot of training and equipment, does have the longest operating time, but has the shortest hospitalization and recovery, but has the overall greatest risk of complications, unfortunately, are probably related to training and skill. Um, and there is some debate also about its cost effectiveness, again, probably related to the time in theater and the skill of the surgeon. So what are the complications of hysterectomy? Well, infection can occur in the abdominal incision, in the vaginal vault and in the pelvic area, so you can get the pelvic cellulitis, and occasionally patients can be quite well with this. And also, if they develop a hematoma, that can also become uh, infected. Blood loss can occur during the procedure and the immediate postoperative period. Um, there can be bladder dysfunction, um, including urinary retention um, and cystitis. There is some evidence to show that hysterectomy may affect bowel function. And at the time of the surgery, we may have damaged bladder, the bowel, and the ureters. There's also some debate with respect to uh, long-term whether the patients are more likely to be uh, get depressed, uh, to suffer with clinical depression or sexual dysfunction. And in the longer term, patients may have wound pain. There is some evidence to show that menopause is on average about six months earlier than the had hysterectomy. And also you may get prolapse of the bulge or of the cervix if it's left in place. Overall, the risks are about 30 to 40 percent of minor complications. Um, but overall, um, the complication rate is related to the pathology. So if you are removing a uterus for very difficult endometriosis or fibroids, the complication rate um, is a little bit higher. And looking at those complications, um, and these are long-term major complications from between abdominal hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy, and laparoscopic hysterectomy, you can see that Laparoscopic hysterectomy has the highest complication rates. Um, also, the post operative complication rates. Urinary incontinence, slightly greater with all hysterectomies. Severe, um, severe urinary incontinence, again, slightly greater. Um, urinary frequency and urgency, there may be a worsening there. Um, and again, bladder symptoms may disapprove uh, following hysterectomy. Women are more likely to need a blood transfusion. Um, more especially with the laparoscopic approach. Bowel injuries, vascular injuries, pelvic hematomas, they all can occur. Infection of the vagina cuff, uh, the wound uh, can become infected um, with uh, an abdominal hysterectomy. And the small laparoscopic wounds as well can become um, a 
problematic. Um, so you can get about a 1% risk of urinary tract injury, about a 1% chance of bleeding, uh, chest infections, and, and uh, venous thromboembolism is also um, a potential risk. So when we look at the NICE guidelines for hysterectomy, looking at hysterectomy for a heavy be periods, um, hysterectomy is not the first choice when it comes to the management of heavy periods. Uh, but women who do not want to have any more family may be an option. Uh, also, uh, if you don't want to have any periods or any bleeding at all, hysterectomy is the procedure of choice. Um, and you know we need to go into things like complications, uh, sexual and psychological issues afterwards, the risk of complications, issues with bladder function, the need for further surgery. Is because some women, if you leave the ovaries behind, uh, there will be a percentage of that will require further surgery. And then the issues of surrounding the removal of the ovaries. Um, now, whether you can do a vaginal hysterectomy is basically decided by the mobility and descent of the uterus and vaginal access. So if you have a uterus that uh, isn't surrounded with adhesions, previous surgery, if you have a uterus that isn't, uh, hasn't been involved uh, in endometriosis or large fibroids, the procedure choice uh, is really the vaginal approach, and that is dependent on how well that uterus is and how well that it comes down the, the, the vagina. Vaginal hysterectomy is the root of first choice, um, and if you do need to remove uh, the ovaries, a laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy is probably the best approach, um, although you can perform oophorectomy at vaginal hysterectomy. It's not easy, but it can be done. Um, and also, to minimize the risk, especially for menstrual bleeding, heavy, heavy periods, um, a subtotal hysterectomy where you leave the cervix behind is, is an option. Now, whether we remove the cervix or not, um, it's an option only really during abdominal or laparoscopic hysterectomy. It is a more difficult procedure, but historically it's been the one that has been performed. If you don't, if you leave the cervix, the operative time um, and blood loss is far less. So, and we often find that in scenarios where things aren't going well or there's a lot of pathology, we do tend to leave the cervix behind. Um, and, you know, the question as to whether uh, it should be left behind is a patient choice, but, you know, there isn't any major evidence to show that hysterectomy, um, leaving the cervix, improves sexual function. Um, but you know, the, the, there are pros and cons to leaving the cervix. I think we should be leaving the cervix more and more as it may help support the upper vagina and prevent all um, descent, but that is something that uh, does require long-term study. Whether to remove the ovaries, well, um, reduce, removing the ovaries does reduce the risk of breast cancer. Uh, you know, it is more special, it is more important to do it if the patient does have BRCA mutations. About 1 in 10 women will have to have an operation subsequently to remove ovaries if it's left behind at the initial uh, hysterectomy. Um, and also if you remove the ovaries, women are straight into a menopause. And they, the symptoms with that can be difficult. And it is that is that's the major problem with the ovaries. It is premature menopause. And there is some evidence to suggest that a surgical menopause may be worse than um, uh, you know, the natural menopause. Some women do have their own opinions on this, and we have to respect that. Also, there is some questioning as to whether there is a hormonal function in postmenopausal ovaries that may have something to do with uh, libido, uh, etc. And again, the decision to remove the ovaries is best discussed with the patient. I personally think we should leave at least one ovary um, in women that are under 45 years of age, and certainly we should discuss whether we should leave uh, an ovary in women. Uh, of, of older than that. The nice recommendations on this is that healthy ovaries should not be routinely removed. Um, Oophorectomy should only be performed with a woman's express wishes and consent, um, and you know it's something that uh, needs to be kept in mind. After hysterectomy, most women, unless they've had a subtotal hysterectomy, do not need to have cervical smears, um, and uh, estrogen replacement therapy um, is an option in women where you do remove both ovaries, um, but you have to take other factors like family history, the personal history of cancer or being a strong
So hopefully that will now give you an understanding and an overview of uh, hysterectomy, how we perform and why we perform it. Thank you.